of the College of Architecture and Design. It's my pleasure to welcome and introduce Tom Leslie tonight. Tom Leslie is an architect, um, which I also say because he's also a number of other things too that we'll, we'll talk about and you'll get a sense for tonight. His undergraduate degree is from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And then in creating introductions for people, you try and do a little bit of digging and look around. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting in looking at his CV is that even as an undergraduate student, he won an award called the Edward Long Scholarship for the Integration of Art and Architecture and an award from the Society of Architectural Historians. So even at an at a undergraduate level, he was doing some things that you'll realize have implications on the work that he's doing now. I don't think that you, you didn't start out thinking that you were going to be looking at history, did you? No. <laughs> no. Um, and as, a, as evidence of that, he went on and did his MARC at Columbia, and even at that point received an award for history and theory. Um, and I mention that because it's amazing to see that there was already an interest in integration of design and technology, uh, and we'll see that tonight in Tom's scholarship. As students, your interests may also blossom into future pro professional trajectories. So I think it's interesting to look back and see that maybe there's a, a thread of something that might continue later. Um, Tom practiced after school, and he was an associate in Foster and Partners office in London. Um, he's got professional chops. He's an architect. Uh, this summer, I was fortunate enough to be in New York and see him as he was inducted into the AIA College of Fellows. Uh, and that alone is a pretty great um, accolade. In 2013-2014, he was the Booth Family Fellow in Historic Preservation at the American Academy in Rome. And then I've also known Tom for many years. I think we met at a conference in 2000 or 2001. Yep in Austin, Texas. Uh, and then in 2005, he released a really, really incredible book on Louis Kahn called Louis Kahn, Building Art and Building Science. Uh, and I want to say a bit about this and put it in a broader context. For me, I think it's also related to the work that he's going to talk about tonight as well. And from Louis Kahn's lecture titled Structure and Form from 1962, Khan, I've, there's a quote from Khan, and what he was saying is that form is what, design is how. Design is a circumstantial act. How much money there is available, the site, the client, the extent of knowledge, and form has nothing to do with those circumstantial, circumstantial conditions. Um, and I say that Tom's Khan book is incredible because it unpacks those circumstantial aspects of some of Khan's key buildings. We don't always get a sense for behind the scenes. We don't always get a sense for how buildings are made um, because we see the kind of finished product. The design and engineering of the key building elements, the design of the systems, and even aspects like the design of the formwork. These are things that we don't always get a sense for. So to this day, because of Tom's book, I remember what the design of the formwork for the Kimball Museum looks like. And that in itself is a really innovative thing and a, an amazing story to understand. So I love this care for integration and how we imagine the impact of design through many disciplines and many different approaches. Tom's newest book is on Pierre Luigi Nervi, and it's called Beauty's Rigor. Patterns of Production in the Work of Pierre Luigi Nervi. And he once again researched the making of work, the work of Nervi, and he's able to tell us stories about these buildings, how they came into being, and why they are the way they are. So I love Tom's work because it exposes us to this thinking and gives us insight into the making of architecture. Tom Leslie's also the moral, moral? Morrill, Morrill yeah. professor in architecture at Iowa State University. He's taught history, design, technology since 2000. He's teaching professional practice classes, and now he's also teaching Renaissance and <laughs> Renaissance history classes. Um, so in a lot of ways, Tom is a kind of Renaissance man in terms of being an architect, a scholar, 
uh, and a really great educator. He's won a number of teaching awards at Iowa State as well. He's held positions at the University in Bologna, the University of Technology in Sydney, the Bauhaus, and he also holds a joint appointment uh, at North Northwestern University. So at a school like ours, where we're focused on the confluence of design, technology, and practice, I'm really excited and really happy to, to have Tom with us here this evening to share his research on the integration of these issues. So please help me in welcoming Tom Leslie to Lawrence Technological University. Well, uh, thank you, Carl. That um, uh, sort of extraordinary introduction, but um, it, it's interesting to, to think back and to hear your resume sort of come back at you. And I, I, I think one thing that maybe you'll see in the talk is that um, you know, even though I was trained as an architect, capital A, went into practice, um, I, you know, history is always, was always the thing as an undergrad that I found really fun. Uh, and I never really thought about making a career of it until I'd been teaching for a few years and realized that A, it was a good way to teach. Uh, I've, I occasionally teach structures and I teach it using history, right? The history of structural engineering as a way of kind of going back to when nobody knew anything uh, and, and building things up from there. And the more I got into it, the more I realized, like, not only is this really something that um, is kind of, you know, the, the passion that I've always had that I never quite realized, um, but also because I had gone a different direction, I came back to it in a way that gave me a, a, a pretty unique perspective. Um, I don't have a PhD. I'm not a, a trained uh, historian. I like to tell um, audiences that I'm not a licensed historian, um, which uh, usually gets a laugh from licensed architects uh, in the audience. Um, but I think that's actually been a real advantage, right? That I've come at history from practice and I've tried to tell the story of how buildings like actually get built, right? No, having sat at the, at the desk in a studio and, and tried to figure things out, I think a lot of times the, the myths that we have about great buildings uh, are just that. And there's always stories about the people who actually sat there and kind of gutted it out and, and made it work. So hopefully, um, I'll, I'll be able to tell that story uh, tonight uh, about this particular Italian uh, engineer and builder, uh, not an architect, although he created some of the most iconic architecture uh, of the 20th century. And Nervi is definitely a kind of mythological figure. If you kind of Google him, you will see inevitably the phrase, a poet in concrete. This is how he was described by the New York Times and The New Yorker and Life Magazine and all of these kind of general interest publications uh, in the 1950s and 1960s. He uh, achieved international fame. Uh, some buildings I'll show were from the 1960 Olympics. Uh, he built a couple of arenas, uh, a stadium, uh, uh, some other uh, facilities that were some of the first Olympic structures to be broadcast on television worldwide. And so as people are watching the Olympic Games, in the background there are these incredible structures, some of them seemingly lightweight and lacy, very, very different from what people were used to seeing in not just sports structures, but in long span structures. And Nervi got this reputation as this kind of magician. Um, it didn't hurt that he was a very well-spoken uh, Italian, uh, very dapper suits, as you can see, uh, a, a kind of figure that w he was just kind of primed for celebrity. And he's been interesting to me because, first of all, I, I use Nervi's work all the time teaching structures, and, and they are so um, expressive of the structural forces within them uh, that they're kind of useful, right? pedagogically useful. But there's something also about Nervi's work that people found particularly beautiful that they didn't always feel about other buildings. And so as an example, um, on the right, this is the Palazzetto della Sport, uh, the small sports stadium that he built for the 1960 Olympics uh, as a kind of prototype for the, uh, for the Olympics. Um, and on the left, it w well, when the Palazzetto was built, it was the largest reinforced concrete dome uh, in the world. 
Um, the larger sports palace that Nerevi built in Rome broke that record, and then another uh, Nerevi building broke the record. And then on the left, the kingdom in 1976 held the record for uh, 25 years. Uh, but even though it's a bigger project, the kingdom nobody thought of as beautiful. Right? Everyone thought that this was a, a horrible pile of, of concrete, brilliantly engineered, right? an incredible piece of, of structural engineering, but nobody thought it was beautiful. And the Palazzetto is still in Rome. The kingdom, as some of you probably know, was imploded. Right? It was probably the least loved building on the planet. So what makes one building beautiful? What gives one building this kind of value that makes us want to kind of treasure it and take care of it and hold on to it? Whereas a building that's arguably more impressive, right, bigger, holds more people, larger span, uh, what makes us think of that building as, as, as not beautiful, right, or, or, or you know, makes us even want to get rid of it? And so what I hope to show you tonight, I, I want to tell Nervi's story because I think it's a really fascinating one. But then I also want to show how some of the things that uh, Nervi had to struggle with and against actually helped distill his buildings, right? Make his buildings so simple and so kind of pure that they ended up almost like they almost had to be beautiful, right? They had to be elegant because there was no room to be kind of anything but. It's a slightly um, abstruse argument, but I hope by the end of the talk, you'll, um, I'll, I'll be able to make clear kind of what I mean. I think the key to Nervi's career lies in these two buildings in Rome. On the left, this was an apartment block that Nervi built uh, with his cousins in 1930. Uh, Nervi and Nebbiosi, these, he, this was his contracting firm at the time. Nervi's apartment was on the top overlooking the Tiber River and Nervi's office was on the ground floor. So this is where he practiced engineering. But Nervi was also a builder. And so on the right, this is a building in South Rome in a district called Maliana that was part of his job site yard. And this was a, a kind of contractor's yard where he and his associates, and particularly his workers, could experiment. And the building that you see there is a, a, a warehouse that he built out of folded plate ferro cemento. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what that is and, and why Nervi used ferro cemento, but it's an experiment. It's a laboratory experiment. And I kind of picture Nervi in the morning, coming downstairs, working as a, a capital E engineer, you know, necktie, suit, uh, very formal, very kind of intellectual. And then in the afternoon, driving down to Meliana and sort of getting his hands dirty, right? And going back and forth between these two worlds of thinking about building and making building. Uh, and, and thinking about engineering, doing the, the engineering on the one hand and doing the actual construction on the other. And this made perfect sense for him because he, was, uh, he sort of grew up as an engineer at the university in Bologna where he, he credited two professors with kind of setting his path. Um, on the left is a theoretical engineer named Silvio Canavazzi who taught concrete theory, taught engineering theory. Uh, Canavazzi was a, a leading figure in um, understanding how to uh, design and to calculate indeterminate structures, which is an important piece of concrete uh, engineering. Um, but again, very intellectual, right? Clean hands, just thinking it through, theorizing about it. The other, maybe more influential professor that Nervi had at Bologna was Attilio Muggia, who you see on the right. And Muggia was actually a practicing contractor and he taught concrete construction. And Bologna's uh, curriculum was set up so that you got both. You got the theory of concrete on the one hand, and you got how to build it uh, on the other. And in fact, after graduation and a, and a couple of uh, false starts, Nervi went to work for Mugia and very quickly kind of proved himself as a, as a project manager. So what did Mugia build? Are they like you know, elaborate, beautiful pieces of concrete? No, they are very pragmatic and frankly, uh, pretty clumsy factory buildings. Um, Mugia's uh, practice basically served the fabric trade uh, around Florence, particularly in a city called uh, Prato. And Nervi gradually took over responsibility for uh, the site work on these projects and gradually started doing them on his own uh, with, with his cousin, uh, Nebiosi. So 
Here on the right, these are very early NERV projects that virtually never get published. And on the left, this is a, a project that NERV did for uh, Mugia. And you can see that these are just as like, simple and dumb factories as you can possibly imagine. And, and one of the reasons I think this is so important is that you know, Nervi didn't start out brilliant. He started out, he sort of got his feet wet or his hands dirty, what, you know, however you like to think of it, in the most kind of basic, simple, um, you know, uncelebrated uh, practice possible. That's an important thing, I think, especially for people getting out of school, right? You do not have to go work for the greatest firm on the planet. You have to go get some real experience in figuring out like how buildings go together, right? How we, how we design them, how we build them. So why concrete, right? Um, why, would, why would concrete be such a big deal in, in the 1930s? And why is Nervi in particular uh, an expert in it? One of the things that um, I got very interested in, and this had to do with being at the American Academy and being surrounded by historians, and particularly modern uh, Italian historians, is that Nervi's timing was really um, interesting and in some ways kind of tragic. Uh, he got out of school right after World War I, and he worked for Mugia. Uh, and then in 1922, the fascists uh, took over, came to power in Italy. And eventually, uh, the, the fascist regime in Italy was sort of persona non grata in the world, and countries started embargoing Italy, right, trying to punish them for things like the invasion of Ethiopia that, that Mussolini led. And this left Italy in, in sort of dire straits. Because, weirdly enough, Italy has never had the materials to have a steel industry. Um, these are two contemporary maps from the 20s that show kind of distribution of natural resources. And the, the two things you need for steel are iron ore, like obviously, uh, and coal. And if you look, you can see that the iron ore and the coal in Europe is all right where, actually, in hindsight, you'd sort of expect it to be. The countries that we think of as the big industrial uh, uh, powerhouses of the 19th and 20th century. So Germany, uh, Netherlands, uh, England, um, this kind of central and northern Europe band of, of resources. And if you look real closely, you can see that Italy has one iron ore deposit on the island of Elba, and it has no coal kind of whatsoever. Um, interestingly enough, Italy is also starved for timber because, of course, builders in Italy have been taking timber not only to build with, but also to burn for fuel to make bricks and things for 3,000 years by this point. So Italy, when they're embargoed, they don't have anything but concrete to work with. And concrete not only becomes the kind of key material uh, for the country, but it also has to be used in a very, very particular way. Eventually, the, these, these um, uh, economic policies, uh, these embargo policies get matched. Mussolini sort of in retaliation says, well, you know what, we're going to be an autarkic society. We're not going to use anything from overseas. We're going to only build with what we have. And he suggests sort of going back to Roman construction, right? Mussolini wants to build in brick and travertine and kind of um, restore the kind of glory of the, of the Roman Empire uh, in Italy. And as World War II is starting, um, Nervi actually publishes a few very, very brave editorials where he says essentially, you know, I don't, I don't know anything about the kind of bigger political scene, but building in, in brick and marble uh, is, is actually kind of a, a dumb thing to do if you're trying to build locally and if you're trying to build efficiently. And his argument is that um, when you're trying, if you're trying to imitate Roman walls and vaults and things like that, you're using a tremendous amount of masonry. And Nervi says, you know, with concrete, we can mold this material to forms that are super efficient. We can use what little steel we have for reinforcing. And if we're careful about the forms, we can minimize the amount of reinforcing that, that, that's going into these. And that actually is a more autarkic is the word, right? It's a more self-sufficient way to build. If we take this new material and figure out how to build efficiently with it, uh, we don't need brick and travertine and all, all this stuff that the, the, that the Romans built with. Um, this is not a popular argument, right? Mussolini wants to build like the Romans for other reasons. Um, Nervi basically, um, uh, this, is the only, this is the last editorial uh, that he writes. 
hard to say, but there was probably some pressure on him to kind of shut up, right? That, that this is the way the country's going and we don't need engineers kind of weighing in on, on the politics of, of building materials. Well, what Nervi um, kind of meant, or, or, the, or the reason that he was able to, to write about this, is that by this point, he and uh, first his cousin, Nebiosi, and then uh, a new business partner, uh, Bartoli, had been building some fairly innovative concrete work by this point, and, and probably their best known was the stadium for uh, Fiorentina, the, the Florence uh, soccer team, that they built in two phases, 1930 uh, to 1932. And so on the left, this is the, the kind of main grandstand with a concrete roof over the top. No way you could build this in brick and travertine, um, although it ended up being sort of clad. On the outside, if you go there today, it's actually clad in this very sort of fascist um, brick and travertine facade. But once you get inside, and once you're in a place where there are some pretty rigorous functional things you have to solve, right? you have to have sight lines that are clear, you have to keep the rain off of the high ticket spectators, but the supports for those want to be kind of raked back out of the way. You either are going to build it in steel, but since uh, the autarkic policies won't let him do that, then you're going to build it in concrete. And you're going to shape the, the concrete beams especially so that they're efficient cantilever shapes. Now, interestingly, uh, he builds uh, this first stand with his cousin, who's a, a, a fairly conservative contractor in 1930. And when he gets his new partner in 1932 and they build the other stand, Nervi gets a little bit more adventurous. And one of the details that he comes up with is this incredible helical stair that, that comes from the desire to bring people in, not from the base, but to bring them in from the top, right, for reasons of sort of uh, crowd control. And you can see that the stair kind of loops out and back. And Nervi uh, balances that with, with uh, another beam that kind of goes the other way, that props it up at the, at the midpoint. And this is a, a fairly efficient way to do that. But it's also really striking. And it's a really, really dynamic form. And I get the sense that Nervi had started looking at things like that cantilevered beam that was sort of honed out of uh, a need to be really, really efficient and realize that if you were forced to hew to really solid structural principles, um, you would create forms that were dynamic in ways that we found kind of inherently beautiful, right? That, that kind of makes sense. Um, this stadium got some worldwide press. Uh, it made Nervi uh, certainly a, a name in the engineering profession in Italy. But the, the things that really got him noticed and the things that, that I think really forged his career uh, were a series of military commissions. Um, he may not have been popular uh, in his uh, editorial opinions, but a concrete engineer who could find ways to build very, very efficiently with whatever materials were to hand was certainly going to be valuable to the Italian military, right, as, as everything sort of headed toward World War II. And in 1937, uh, he entered and won a competition for two aircraft hangars. Uh, near the town of Orvieto, uh, just outside of Rome. And he came up with this kind of brilliant way of uh, covering uh, aircraft with concrete in a, a program type that really should have been steel, right? We, we typically think of steel for things like hangars where you're trying to do a lightweight, long-spanning roof. Nervi doesn't have steel, so how do you do this in concrete? And what he does is sort of hacks together about three or four different structural ideas. So the first thing is that he builds a doubly curved barrel vault, right? So it's a, it's a naturally kind of efficient shape to begin with, right? The arch has some thrusts to it that he can take up with uh, these buttresses along the back, this giant single buttress in the front. You can see there's a horizontal truss that uh, takes the thrust of the, of the shell um, between those buttresses on the front and kind of spreads it out. And then he makes that uh, vault not out of solid concrete, but out of coffered concrete. This is almost like taking a waffle slab and wrapping it around the shape of a vault. So he's getting the depth of all of those crisscrossing beams without most of their weight. Really, really efficient way to, to build this. Um, it's called a lamella system, right? And, it, and in engineering terms, it takes gravity loads and wind loads. It's hyperstatic. It's super redundant. So it makes it very, very efficient. You're able to carry 
the dead weight of the, of the roof, the more weight you take out, of course, the, the, the less you have to carry down into the foundations. And the, these two hangers are seen as almost kind of miraculous. Um, you're, you're building in concrete, but you're spanning with this incredibly lightweight system. Uh, the the military is very happy with them, right? They get these hangers for, for relatively cheap. Uh, and these get published all over the world as kind of, you know, marks of Italian engineering genius. Um, Nervi, though, was not so convinced, and he was actually quite self-critical, kind of quietly self-critical. Because if you look at the construction photos of these, what you realize is that um, by the time all of that concrete, all of that dead load comes down to those buttresses, um, you actually do need an incredible amount of reinforcing steel to transfer all those loads into those point supports, right, into the, into the buttresses. So even though it's a concrete building, Nervi refers to it basically as a steel building in disguise. He's using more steel than, than he thinks is strictly necessary. And if you look at the left, on the left, you can see that there's also a tremendous amount of scaffolding that goes into this. If you pour a concrete vault that's that big, you have to pour it all at once so that it's monolithic. And therefore, you need to form and scaffold the entire hangar. And Nervi, from his construction experience with Mugia, realizes that this has an inherent inefficiency too. He says he's, he's had to build the building twice, once in timber, which we know is, is pretty scarce, and then once again in concrete that uses more steel uh, than he thinks is necessary. So the hangars are a great success, but Nervi sees kind of room for improvement and goes back to his yard in Maliana and realizes a couple of things. He realizes that if you uh, avoid casting the whole thing at once, um, you can avoid using all of this scaffolding. If you can find a way to just scaffold a bit at a time and to prefabricate the roof and especially those lamella beams in smaller sections, um, you can save on scaffolding. He also realizes that if you precast those beams in smaller sections, you can make them in more efficient shapes. And those lamella beams, because they act kind of like arches but kind of like beams, it's very important that they have the two webs, right, that take the tension and compression that go into a bending member. But they don't need all of that concrete in the middle where there's no bending at all, right, no tension or compression at all. So he starts experimenting with these shapes that are uh, kind of open in the middle, right? You can build formwork that allows you to make a, a more precise, more complicated shape on the ground. You can cast a few hundred of these while you're digging the foundations, and then you can put them up sort of piecemeal with a smaller bit of scaffolding. And to get that kind of um, monolithic performance or the, the hyperstatic performance, um, what he comes up with is a way to key these elements into each other. So if you look in the upper left, that octagon is a sketch that Nervi has done showing uh, loops of reinforcing wire coming out of these precast beam elements and being locked together by an octagon of poured in place concrete. So he's pouring little pieces of concrete at a time. He can set all of these precast pieces up very quickly, can come around and just kind of almost like hot glue them together with concrete, take the scaffold, move it to the next piece of the, of the hanger. And he experiments with this. This is another uh, shot in, in the Maliani yard where you can see that he's experimenting with different configurations for those trusses. These are um, essentially Virendil pieces. And you can see that they uh, have basically two flanges and then a web that consists just of these moment connections, right? These struts that, that run across them. And why is this important? Well, if you can take all of that material out of the middle of those elements, you're saving weight. And that means you don't transfer as much weight into the buttresses, which means you don't need as much reinforcement. But Nervi also realizes that you're saving construction money because you're working with smaller elements and you're not having to lift as much up into the air. Later in his career, he gives this lecture where he talks about actually sizing the elements for this freeway overpass, part of the, the 1960 Olympics sizing the elements and calculating the span, not by what he's able to get out of the concrete in terms of performance, but actually in terms of how expensive the crane it has to be to lift those pieces. Nervi's firm is a small firm. They don't own their own equipment. 
He typically had about maybe 25, 30 people working for him. They had to rent all of their lifting equipment. So they had to rent tower cranes or, uh, or boom cranes or whatever. So he realizes that he has he, to save money, he has to work with light pieces. And he has to do this kind of analysis about how big a piece, you know, do you want the, how big a span do you want versus how heavy is that to lift and how much money am I going to have to spend on the crane? And he gets a second commission in 1939. Uh, the Italian Air Force wants more hangars on a couple of different sites and he comes back with this method that actually precasts all of the, uh, uh, the roof elements, lifts them up as you can see on a very light moving scaffold. And if you look closely, you can see there's no crane. These are all just winched up into place, so he doesn't have to go rent a crane at all. And interestingly enough, he, he changes, instead of a Virendil, these are actual uh, truss pieces that you can see in the front. That's Nervi with the necktie standing, looking really, really proud, right? rightly so. And when these hangers are complete, right, so he's saved money on the, he saved weight, right, which saves steel, better performance. He's able to precast them, which saves construction time. But he also has this moment where he realizes that what he's ended up with is pretty beautiful. And instead of just having his assistants take the sort of standard contractual job site photos, he goes to an architectural photographer named Studio Vasari in Rome and commissions them to take pictures of the hangars as architectural works. So the view on the right, this is before a, a lightweight roof gets put in place, but that is a professional architectural photographer taking a picture of what's really the most kind of basic industrial type you can imagine, right, an aircraft hangar. So Nervi has combined structural uh, efficiency with construction efficiency, and he realizes that what he's come up with is architectural beauty, right? that, that all of the kind of restrictions that have been put on him, it's almost like they have distilled this idea down to its most essential. And without trying, he sort of steps back and realizes that, that the thing that he's come up with uh, is actually really extraordinary. And in fact, these hangars were. They, they were all uh, demolished uh, when the, the Germans retreated up the Italian peninsula. Um, and there's this great story about they dynamited the buttresses and these shells all came down and instead of shattering, right, the hyperstatic performance was such that the shells literally just like bounced, right? The, like the, they all came down uh, in one piece. And the other great story, which I've never been able to adequately source, is that when someone came into the office to say, you know, Master Nervi, the, the Germans have blown up the hangars, Nervi is said to have like breathed a huge sigh of relief because he wasn't all that sure that the, that the hangars were actually going to work, right? that they were going to hang up. So it's great that the Germans blew them up and that they didn't fall down on their own. Right? So what's interesting, though, to me about, about these hangars, um, going through the drawings, going through the, the Nervi archives, there are almost no pictures of what the hangars looked like. There are a handful of perspectives that were done pretty quickly. But I would say like 90% of the drawings are either, as you see on the upper left, graphic statics, trying to figure out how each node was going to perform and, and how the loads were going to get distributed into it. Beautiful drawings, a, a, a really gorgeous kind of manual technique for doing structural calculations. Or on the upper right, they are scaffolding drawings. How much timber or you know, how much uh, metal scaffolding are we going to need to, to build this? Or on the lower right, you can see they're basically shop drawings. How are we actually going to make the pieces? And only at the end of this process, right, the end of this very, very logical process, does Nervi step back and say, it's going to look good, right? And I think that the, the, the discipline and the logic and the rigor that goes into this sort of forges this kind of this beauty, right, this kind of unimpeachable, like very, very solid um, sense of, of aesthetics that, 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 that emerges. So one other wartime project, I think, um, combined with this, sort of leads us to Nervi's kind of, kind of formula. Um, in uh, 1942, the Italian Navy uh, puts out a call for concrete ships. If the, the Navy has no steel, and they have no timber, and they need to build warships. And so they go to the engineering community and they say, could we do it out of concrete? Right? That's, all, that's all we got. It seems counterintuitive, but you know, all you have to do is make a hole in the water to make the, the boat float. So if you can make the concrete light enough, 
thin enough, you should be able to float a, a concrete boat. And so Nervi uh, puts, in, uh, puts into the competition. He gets a shipyard with no electricity, no cranes, uh, and limited access, and gets told, we need three of these. And th on the right, this is one of the hulls that, that he and his crew build. The secret to it is a process called ferrocemento, where instead of building in solid blocks of concrete, you take lightweight metal mesh, which Nervi was able to, to get, right? It's a kind of lightweight steel um, uh, product. You take a few rebars and you bend them into the kind of basic shape you want, like lofting lines. You put the mesh over that and then you trowel a very lightweight cement into those layers of mesh. And what you get is a material that behaves somewhere between a steel plate and a, a concrete sheet. Um, it's got a little bit of ductility in it because there's so much steel, but it can be very, very thin. Right? It's like because the reinforcement is spread throughout the, the concrete, it doesn't need to be the two or three inches that you would need to protect the rebar. And you can see on the right, this can be done by hand. No cranes involved, just uh, Italian uh, workmen troweling concrete uh, into this mesh. And it can be done with very, very small crews. And Nerby successfully builds these ships. They never quite see action. The, the Navy by 1943 is kind of on the run. Italy's very clearly losing the war and the, the project gets abandoned. But Nervi doesn't forget this. And he translates this idea into building because he realizes that this is yet another way to hack the process. And it's one thing to precast all of these structural elements out of solid concrete. It would be quite another to build them out of this very thin, very lightweight, very flexible ferrocemento. And right after the war, he begins thinking about how you could make building components out of this technology that he used to make these concrete ships. Um, this is another one of the 1960 uh, Olympic projects, the uh, Stadio Flaminio. And this is it today. Um, it's been largely abandoned, but um, as of just like last week, uh, a team that I'm very proud to be a part of uh, has convinced the city of Rome to think about turning the stadium back into a national rugby center. So I, I'm now suddenly a rugby fan, right? I have to go learn, <laughs> I guess, all about rugby. But the, the, the building has, has held up for 50 years and maybe, maybe has a new life. And you can see that roof over the stadium seating. That is all about two inch thick uh, ferro cemento. So after the war, um, there's no building, of course, in Italy uh, during the war. Uh, but after the war in 1947, um, the country trying to kind of reintroduce itself to the uh, community of nations um, offers to host the International Automobile Show, this annual event that makes sense to hold in uh, Turin because that's where Italy's uh, automotive centers are. Uh, Turin is actually called Italy's Detroit all the time. Uh, Fiat uh, was, was born there and, and still has offices and factories there. Um, and Turin, of course, is, is bombed almost out of existence because it's a heavy industry center. Uh, and the Allies just basically uh, wipes it off the map. So the idea is that this will celebrate the kind of end of the war, the rebuilding of Italy. And uh, Turin offers to host it. The problem is that their exposition center, along with all the factories, was gone, demolished. Um, and they decide that they can host it 18 months before the, the scheduled date. And so they put out what's probably the worst call for proposals ever that says basically we need a giant exposition center, we don't really have enough money, and you have 18 months. Go. Um, and Nervi is one of the few engineers to have the kind of audacity to say, sure, right? Because he has had this experience with Ferro Cemento. He's had this experience with, the, with precasting the hangars. And he realizes that if he breaks this giant long span building down into uh, little pieces that his crew can assemble, if he telescopes the construction time so that while they're digging the foundations, his crew is not constructing the building, but fabricating the building. They can have all of the kind of components ready to go and ready to get put into place when the foundations are done. So using uh, drawings from the archives, I had a, a, a team of grad students do what they started calling IKEA drawings for the, uh, for the turn exposition. 
And um, so this is like the IKEA instruction kit for how to build um, what, what was up to that point Nerebi's greatest work. You take basically uh, metal, sheets of metal mesh, right, metal screen. You build a clay mold in the shape that you want. You fold the mesh down over that, take the mold out, um, and you have this, uh, this worker who, yeah, as you can see, he's still got the cigarette, right? So it's, um, it's authentic, right? That's probably exactly what it looked like. He trowels this lightweight cement into that and then lets it cure. And basically, you build about 800 of these. And Nerby builds them in seven different families, so slightly different sizes. This is, this is a different project on the left, but it, it, it's, the, it's the same process. And on the right, this is a shot of the job site yard uh, as the foundations are finishing up. And Nervi's crew of 20 people has finished all of the pieces for the roof in the time it's taken to, to build the foundations. And you can think of these basically like uh, little ferrocemento boats, right? little uh, V-shaped pieces. So here's the really clever part. Um, Nervi, these are so light that not only does, can, could he have rented a really small crane, he realizes he doesn't even need a crane, that these, are, these can be lifted up by four workmen, and he can build this traveling scaffold, and he can literally just put a winch on top. And two or three workmen can take each one of these pieces up into the air. They can slide them on rails down so they kind of bump up against each other. They grout them together. They pour a little bit of concrete at the top and bottom uh, of each of those kind of uh, corrugations. And once all of that cures, you have uh, a roof that is structurally efficient. It's an arch shape. It's a folded plate. All of that saves on uh, material. Uh, constructionally efficient because it's ferrocemento, so it doesn't use a lot of material. And it's all been built basically in free time, right, as, as they've been building the, the foundations. It opens on time, on budget. And again, not only is it a feat of engineering, right? Nobody writes about the fact that it got built in 18 months. Critics come and they see what this looks like and they're like, this is you know, one of the most incredibly beautiful pieces of engineering on the planet, right? Again, there's very few drawings of what this thing was gonna look like. Nervi just had this finely honed process and this structural intuition. And he creates this thing um, that leaps across the space successfully, but then also has this very human scale kind of imprinted onto it. If you look, you can see that you can pick out each one of the little ferrocemento boats, right, or, or uh, elements. And that is the size of something that four people can lift up. So there's automatically this sort of human scale that gets imprinted, right, this pattern that gets imprinted onto the roof. And we don't only see the structural logic we get a sense for the pattern of construction, right? the way the thing was put together and how it, it sort of breaks down. Um, and interestingly, so this is a, a worm's eye and you can see the kind of main hall and all of these um, folded plates get brought down very elegantly with these ferro-cement uh, pans or uh, uh, sort of Y-shaped forks into concrete, uh, poured in place concrete buttresses. Um, around the back, one of the exhibit designers demanded what they called an apse. They wanted a, a half dome that was that where they could put like the kind of prize winning cars uh, and things like that. And um, Nervi, being a good structural engineer, said, well, a half dome is kind of a dumb shape structurally. And they said, yep, architecturally, though, this, this is what we want. And so there's some shenanigans in here about how you make a half dome work and how you take care of the thrusts. But the really interesting part is that Nervi looked at that concrete surface and realized that you could tile that spherical surface using a very, very similar process to what was going on uh, in, the, in, the, in the main hall. So here you can see on the left, these are workers that are building uh, triangular ferro-cement pans. And on the right, you can see some of those pans at the bottom and then diamond-shaped pans on top. By triangulating the surface into kind of families of similarly sized pans, Nervi is able to get the surface done with kind of formwork that's made out of ferro cement that he's then going to leave in place. And in that apse, when you're looking up, what you're seeing is the bottom of those ferro cement pans, right? It's like a waffle slab that's now wrapped around a spherical surface. And it's doing the same thing that the lamella arches did in the hangars. 
it's basically coffering a thick dome, and it's tricking that dome into thinking that it's thicker than it is, right? Or behaving like it's thicker than it is. Um, engineers hate it when I say things like that, but that to me is like the, the, the way to think about it, right? The dome thinks it's a big, like, you know, two foot deep dome, and in reality, it's about four inches, four inches thick. And so ferro cement here gets used in two ways. One as an actual structural element, right? Little boats that together make up uh, these folded plate arches. And here it's being used as formwork that creates this very, very intricate, uh, geometrically uh, kind of wrapped waffle slab. And Nervi learns from this as well. And there are a series of projects that he does in the 40s and 50s where he realizes that if you use ferro cement for formwork, you can get any shape you want. And so if you want to do a waffle slab, you can do a waffle slab, but you can do a waffle slab that has a little bit more nuance and a little bit more um, expression than the sort of typical, uh, typical pattern of squares. So um, here is a, a, a building uh, in Bologna, a warehouse for a, a tobacco, the national tobacco concern. Um, there's a, a book that a bunch of Italian scholars are doing that, that's coming out uh, early next year. Um, and they asked me to do an essay on the formwork for it. And so this was an awesome opportunity to go back to the archives, to go see this thing, and to look at the process that Nervi used for, for building it. And basically, what Nervi did is he created this building machine, this kind of reverse stamper almost. And you can see it on the left. And what he's got there is he has ferro cement pans. And if you look closely, you can see that they're shaped so that the, the beams and the girders all flare out as they come to their uh, supports. And that reflects that they're picking up massive amounts of shear from the dead weight of the, uh, of the concrete above. And ordinarily in a waffle slab, you throw a little bit of extra reinforcement in as, they, as the joists come into the girders. Here in Nervi's saying you can take care of it all with the material right? and uh, get both a, a slightly more efficient uh, shape out of it and also one that's a little bit more expressive. So there were about um, uh, 18 of these machines that just went, that kind of leapfrogged one another and basically extruded the building, right? Just sort of went down the job site building floor after floor after floor. And even though human beings were never meant to kind of walk in these spaces and look at them, right? These are supposed to be full of tobacco bales. Um, when you stand in this space, you see a waffle slab that's telling you something about how it works with the flared out uh, details that, that, that handle the extra shear and also how it was made. Nervi cast the columns using traditional timber forms and he left them super rough. The ferrocemento forms were oiled so that they have a very, very smooth surface. And when you're standing in this space, you get a real sense for what was kind of rough cast in timber and what was cast against these, these more expressive uh, forms. More famous version of this, the one maybe you've seen in, uh, in uh, modern history textbooks or in, or in lectures, uh, was a wool factory that he did outside of Rome. And, and one of his engineers said, you know, if you can make them any shape you want, you could make them so that they express the kind of isostatic lines of, of stress in a slab. You can think of these almost as um, topographic maps of, of where the, the stresses are. And so Nervi does this, right? This is largely ornamental. There's no real reason that you need to do this. Um, but it's a way, again, of making the, the building kind of speak about what it's doing right? and, and about how it's made. And again, the fact that all of these have to be lifted by teams of two or three guys means that there is a, a pattern imprinted on the structure that gives it a kind of inherent sense of scale. It makes us see um, something that not only kind of performs well, but is also clearly made by, by human hands. So when Nervi gets the, the commission to do this prototype arena uh, in Rome in, in 1957, um, he decides to take the same system that made the uh, apps of the Turin Exposition Hall, and this time to do a complete dome with it. And you can see on the left, this is the job site yard. So again, while they're digging foundations, he's got 20 guys just making these ferro cement pans over and over and over again. You can see this team of five guys in the lower left in their OSHA approved felt caps, right? <laughs> uh, hauling some of these pans to the job site. And you can see a very, very light tower crane um, that they rented for less than 60 days, putting all of these pans onto the formwork below. 
Nervi, interestingly, later in his career, advised a client, he said, uh, I wouldn't build a dome, right? A dome is structurally more efficient, but uh, at the Palazzetto, again, we had to scaffold the whole thing. And, and that's a pain, right? What you really want to do is you want to do extruded shapes like Turin, not because they're structurally more efficient, but because they're easier to build, right? You can reuse the scaffold. So this, I think, is, is the, the building that um, really made Nervi's name. And again, it's a giant span, right? Bigger, the biggest reinforced concrete span uh, on the planet at the time. There are these moments outside. Nervi takes the, the uh, thrust of the dome. Uh, first of all, he kind of uh, stiffens it by putting this sort of pie crust shape around the outside. That also brings a lot of light into the space, as you can see on the right. And then he has these forked buttresses cast in place that do the same thing as the fans in turn that collect all of the loads from the roof and sort of separate them out, bring them down to discrete points uh, in the ground. So you have plenty of space, not only for the light, but also for people to walk in and out. Um, also, uh, in the construction, Nervi realized that what you wanted to do is you wanted to build the dome first, and then you wanted to come in and excavate the, the seating bowl because if you built the dome first, it would keep the rain off, so you don't have to worry about the site flooding as you're digging into the, the ground to build the seats. So thinking at kind of all levels of the thing. Super efficient structure, very efficient process. Nobody cared about that, right? What everybody wrote about was how incredibly lacy and lightweight this thing was. Um, it got called a concrete pantheon, right? It's only a couple miles from the pantheon, and it's a dome in Rome, so American critics especially thought instantly, like, oh, well, the, you know, the pantheon must be Nervi's inspiration. And an Italian critic wrote back and said, uh, you know, the, the difference between this and the pantheon is twofold. One, um, the pantheon brings all of its daylight in from the top, and Nervi's actually found a way to bring the daylight in from under the dome. And the Romans sure couldn't do that. And the other thing that people note is that, you know, the Pantheon's dome is up to like 18 feet thick. And Nervi's dome is, depending on how you measure it, right, if you, if you measure just the, the slab of concrete that's poured over those pans, it's four or five inches. And proportionally, that is thinner than an eggshell. And this Italian critic writes back and says, never mind the Pantheon, that Nervi has outdone nature. This is, this is a thinner shell than, than even nature could build. Okay, it has the ribs, which stiffen those and, and thicken that up quite a bit. But it's an incredibly elegant solution, not only in terms of the structure, but also in terms of the construction. And again, there's no, this is a drawing that my, my team and I did. There's no Nervi drawing that's quite like this or that's done during the process. There are drawings that got done for the press afterwards. But I get the sense that Nervi didn't really know or care about what it was going to look like until the very end of the, of the process. Um, the other dome that he built uh, is worth touching on. This is the, pal the Palazzo dello Sport, the, the big sports palace in Rome uh, that he does just in time for the Olympics. And it's almost like a, a sort of catalog of every trick Nervi had in the book. If you look closely, you can see that these are uh, V-shaped ferro-cement ribs that form the dome, just like Turin, except instead of being extruded, these are now wrapped around a, a circular plan. You can see that there are these fins, very much like the ones in Turin, that take the dome's loads down uh, onto this deck. The second deck actually serves as a tension ring that helps hold the dome together. And then you can see these very eloquent uh, piers or supports that take the loads down into the foundation. Um, in a lot of ways, this was a, a, more, uh, a, a more impressive building. It was a larger span. There's a lot more going on to it. Um, and as a result, it's a building that I think it doesn't quite have the aesthetic resonance uh, that, the, that the smaller sports palace does. It's still pretty good, right? It's still pretty amazing. Um, but this almost kind of proves the point that when Nervi had the, the money and the budget to throw everything, every idea he had in, uh, the building's actually not quite as good. Right? The Palazzetto had to be built to a much tighter budget, to a much tighter schedule to prove that the Italians could build Olympic buildings. And Nervi there, I think, is under the, all that kind of um, pressure, and it sort of hones the idea down to its, its very, very basic components. Here, there's a lot more going on. Still a great building, but it doesn't have that kind of clarity uh, that I think the small sports palace does. 
Okay, nevertheless, the Palazzo della Sport is one of the buildings that people see on TV. Um, this is a, a, a young Cassius Clay winning the gold medal uh, with Nervi behind him. Uh, most people look at this and see the future Muhammad Ali. I look at it and say, that's a great Nervi shot right there, <laughs> right? Um, and they're all, of course, looking at the concrete detailing. Right? Uh, they're all going, wow, that's an amazing junction of, of, of concrete back there. Um, What's really, really interesting is that, the, so here's an engineer who has a career that comes out of the most dire circumstances possible, right? A shipyard with no electricity and no lifting equipment and 20 guys, many of whom are not particularly skilled, right? This is where all of this comes from. And at the end of the day, these buildings get built that are not only kind of broadcast worldwide, right? Not only capture critics' attentions, but if you look at the kind of, um, uh, popular press of the era. Um, this is the Palazzo Dello Sport on the left in Vogue magazine, right? We should all be so lucky to have one of our designs end up in fashion magazines someday. Um, on the right, this is uh, a, a film by Michelangelo Antonioni in 1962. Um, that is uh, Monica Vitti walking in front of the Palazzo Dello Sport, and this whole movie takes place in the neighborhood around the Palazzo, and it keeps showing up. It's almost like a character. And it's one of about five uh, pieces of Italian cinema that use Nervi buildings in the 60s as their backdrop. And the, the buildings are kind of a symbol of Italian progress and Italian kind of, um, uh, uh, certainly Italian engineering. But they also, I think, are symbols of how Italy had developed a reputation for taking things like typewriters, motor cars, basketball arenas, and making beauty out of these things that no one had ever thought were aesthetic objects before. And it's, it's not until a Fiat and Ferrari come along that anyone starts thinking that the cars can be beautiful things. I think Nerevi is very much, very much part of that. Um, so interestingly, Nerevi has this second career almost after this. And he gets jobs all over the world where he's hired as consulting engineer but of course he can't be hired as contractor. And so he has to farm the actual construction of his buildings out to local contractors to build. And these buildings, are, some of them are, are truly wonderful, but none of them have the kind of clarity of the work that he did both as a designer and as a builder. Um, tower that he did with Harry Seidler on the left, a cathedral in San Francisco in the middle, and a hockey arena for Dartmouth College on the right. All of these are absolutely nervy buildings, and you can spot in some cases, you know, some of the techniques, the ferro cement pans uh, in the middle one, these twisting timber forms that he used for piers, like in the Palazzo della Sport uh, on, on the right. And I have to show this one because this was one that um, this, this project uncovered that I find really extraordinary. This is a, a, a viaduct project uh, just outside of San Francisco that the California Department of Transportation and Kaiser Steel hired Nervi to do a kind of a prototype design. And they go to Italy to hire the world's greatest concrete designer and say, can you do this in steel? <laughs> Baffling, right? Um, but Nervi responds which, what, with what I think is a really, really interesting proposal. He takes ideas that he's had, you know, you remember that concrete viaduct for the Olympics with the crane? He says, well, you can do the same shape in steel you can make it hollow, right? make it lightweight. Um, these piers are those same twisting uh, elements that he did at Dartmouth and that he did in the, in the uh, Palazzo, but they're made out of relatively thin sheets of steel because he can twist those just like he can twist uh, timber formwork. Um, I, I showed this at an a, a engineering conference of um, shell, concrete shell engineers and one of them raised their hand and said, my professional opinion is that that is gonna have some buckling problems. Um, and that's probably true, but Nervi's ambition here is sort of amazing, right? Like these are hollow steel legs that sit on these very, very tiny kind of expressive uh, pin joints. Um, Caltrans eventually wanted absolutely nothing to do with this. They went out and built a sort of regular concrete uh, bridge and dismissed the quote unquote architect from Italy. Right, they actually said, like, you know, architects from overseas are coming and telling us how to do bridges. We know how to do bridges. Um, so they mistook Nervi for an architect, right? And if you kind of read between the lines, you know, someone who worries more about beautiful things than about practical things. It's too bad. This would have been a, a pretty amazing work. 
Um, okay, so like, what do we take from this? Um, Nervi uh, gave this series of lectures uh, at Harvard, the Norton Lectures in Poetry, right? There's that word again. He, he got brought in to give lectures on poetry uh, in 1961. And this series had already had a tradition of bringing people in whose work was described as poetic, but who worked in other fields, so painters or musicians. Uh, but Nervi was the first engineer. And among other things, uh, the, so the title is Aesthetics and Technology in Building. And in his kind of opening, he gives what I think of as his thesis, right? Thesis for his whole career. Um, the relationship between technology and aesthetics can be defined like this. The objective data of the problem, technology and statics. And note that he makes a difference between technology and statics. Right? Technology is how you build it. Statics is how it functions. Um, these sort of very hard facts suggest solutions and forms. They don't determine solutions and forms, but they suggest them. The designer's aesthetic sensitivity, even if you're an engineer, you're a designer, right? So even if you're an engineer, you can have some aesthetic sensitivity. Um, that designer has to understand the intrinsic beauty and validity, has to be open to those suggestions, and then has to do the work of playing around with it, modeling it, emphasizing it, detailing it uh, in, in a personal manner, which he says constitutes the artistic element in architecture. Objective data of the problem on one, on one hand, right? Hard sciences, aesthetic sensitivity of the designer on the other. These things for Nervi are inextricably linked. And I think if, you, if we kind of think really hard about you know, being called a poet in concrete. Right? We think of poets as kind of off, like, you know, doing whatever they want, coming up with ideas that, that don't have to kind of make any sense, but just kind of hit our imagination. That's not totally true, right? When the poets write in uh, various forms, various styles, right, things that have rules. And when poets bump up against those rules, right, and have to conform to a number of syllables or a type of stanza or something like that, that pressure makes them think about their word choice, makes them think very hard about you know, what their options are, limits their options in ways that makes them think hard. And I think a similar thing is going on when we look at the work of Nervi, that he had to work within not just one set of rules, right? not just structural engineering, not just contracting. He had to work within multiple sets of rules. And those constraints, I think, forged this really, really, really unique sensitivity where he had to think so hard about the details, he had to think so hard about the materials, and he had to think so hard about the kind of patterns or algorithms, the way that his small crews were gonna go build these buildings, that it seems like almost inevitable that at the end you get something that sort of approaches uh, poetry. Um, skip ahead of that. So the, the, the point of the, the book is to say that um, this fluency, right, this ability, this knowing the rules like so well and practicing within them gives him buildings that have this incredible resonance with us. Right? We look and we don't just see this incredible span. We see an incredible span that has imprinted on it a human scale. And that human scale isn't arbitrary or, or painted on. That human scale comes from the actual humans that made the building, right? We're reading that process, we're reading the scale of the process onto this massive span. And being able to see both things at once, I think gives his buildings this kind of resonance that other big shells, the kingdom for instance, uh, doesn't have. Um, I will just as a plug also say that aesthetics and technology and building has just been uh, re-released, republished. Um, it comes with uh, critical essays by, by Nervi scholars and a kind of history of how Nervi gets hired to give the, the, the Norton lectures. It's a project that I've, again, been uh, really uh, thrilled to, to work on. Um, and I'll, I'll leave you with this, um, which is Nervi in his office uh, in Rome, uh, thinking away. You can see the, um, the ashtray in the foreground, right? It's in the 60s. You can see the, that hangar on the left, right? A, a reminder, that building is 30 years old, but there's a, a, a rigor to that and a, a success to that that Nervi obviously is still inspired by. 
And the guy's not only drawing, but he's thinking. He's thinking really hard. And it may not be these kind of big, you know, poetic thoughts. It may just be about, um, you know, how he can save a little money or, or, or save some labor on a project. But whatever is coming out of that pen is almost certainly going to be beautiful. Thank you. Questions. Take some questions. Right? Sure. Yeah. Tom, I want to thank you. It was really beautiful in the way that you just summarized that too, in terms of talking about the role of the hand. We talked a little bit about a few of the things, and and maybe I can prod you a little bit on some of it. There were two things that we talked about at lunch. One that I feel like it's necessary to say: this is before computers. Yeah. Right. So there's no grasshopper involved in the making of this. This is long before the internet. And some of what we know of his work as well is that in order to test some of them, and maybe not some of the projects that you showed, but they built large physical models to actually test them structurally to see if they would work, and just the time and effort and money that went into those. Um, and then the other thing that you told me that just kind of blew my mind about all of Newbery's work is that he was a contractor as well, and he was the lowest bidder on some of these projects. Always. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> and, and, and that's the sort of pressure, right? He, he had, first of all, you know, he was able to go back and forth between the office and the job site yard. So he was fluent in both worlds. Um, but he was also like, if you've been the designer and now you get to bid on that project, you know the project pretty well and you've designed it to your specifications, right? Um, uh, the model thing is, is its own great story. There's actually a book on the models that this university structures lab built to test his projects, right? There's no way to calculate hyperstatic structures in, in the 1950s. So you have to build a plaster model and you have to tune the plaster so that it behaves like concrete, like scaled up. There's all kinds of like crazy, you know, back and forth about, you know, how you do that. And then literally you like load the thing up and see how much it moves and stand back and go, yeah. <laughs> um, and and the, the thing is that um, with one great exception is, as we talked about when Nervi didn't fully understand that San Francisco was a seismic zone, um, Nervi's intuition was, he's, it was almost always correct, right? They would, they would go test the things because code says you've got to test them. And the correspondence back is always like, yep, as usual, right? You got it right. You know, maybe adjust something here or there, but you know, the, the thing didn't fall down, right? But the time and effort and investment that went into those, that today, you know, we can test in like seconds. And to me, I, I wonder if there's a discipline there as well that, um, uh, that influenced the design or, or that you know, forged some of this, right? Today, we can do whatever we want, right? It doesn't cost any money to, to test crazy ideas. Back then, it cost money and, and time to do it, for sure. Uh, Tom, yeah, thanks for the lecture. It was fantastic. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I I think about a lot, but also this makes me really think about it, is some of the most important designs that we have is when architects, and in this case engineers, work so well within a set of limits. And I, I was just having a conversation with a student today who felt like their particular studio was limit like there was too many limits to where they couldn't do good design and yeah. I was trying to explain to them that um, actually having these limits is what enables you to do good design and at least in my opinion and I think um, this is a great example of a body of work that is exemplary of that the thing that I would like to ask or or put forward is that it also seems that that Nervi paired intellectual rigor about his topic along with um, kind of the structural limits of materials in a way that's innovative but he also a third thing that he seems to have paired with it very well is operating with what amounts to an economic crisis I mean this is between the wars there's an embargo on material and uh, a lot of 
uh, we're, we've experienced that obviously in 2008 and we're going to ex probably experience it again. But the issue is, is that he was able to perform in an economic limitation that, I mean, no one else could build this, this building in Turin. I yeah. mean, he got the job, it seems, because he was the only one that could really deliver it. And it's, a, I think, a lesson for today, at least, uh, with some of the economic issues that, that we'll face, that maybe we can't do buildings the way we've all the, always done them. We have to work within an economic limit. And I don't know if, if that is something that you kind of thought about in the book or if it's something mm -hmm. that uh, maybe you found in other, other people's work as well. Yeah. Well, anyone who's practiced knows that, you know, you, yeah, but, but that you never have as much money as you want and you never have as much space as you want. You never have as much time as you want. Um, but I mean, compared with 1930s Italy, like we're fine, yeah. right? Like even in 2008, yeah. uh, we were okay. Um, I think that, you know, w what, it, what it means is that you have to be clever. And in, in Nervi's case, you know, I, I say about Turin or, or the Palazzetto, you, you or I could go build that in our backyard if our backyard were big enough. You know, he found a way to just simplify it and to, to turn it into a, a, a simple process that, of course, it's brilliant, right? It had to be brilliant or none of that could have gotten, could have gotten built. Um, and, you know, also with Nervi, there's like, a, there's an entrepreneurial spirit that I, it, interestingly, I see in a lot of schools today, um, students who, you know, want to have their own business and maybe not a traditional design business, but, you know, a design build business or something like that. And um, that kind of uh, financial savviness I think it goes, a, goes a long way uh, a lot of times. I mean, you know, shop is probably the cliche for this, but they realized one day that they were going to client meetings and the developers wore better watches than they did. So why aren't we developers, right? Clearly they're the ones winning, so let's figure out, you know, how to, how to do that. And, um, I, you know, I, I think that's not something to shirk from. I think that that, that gives us more kind of, control of the process and we're sort of, you know, we get to, gives us leverage for what we, what we value. Um, and the tighter the economic constraints, you know, the, the, the more the only, the only ones who are left are the ones who are smart enough or clever enough or just bloody minded enough to, to forge ahead. So. Any other questions? Is that like it's only two weeks left in the semester or something? That's, yeah. It's a f familiar, familiar kind of look throughout. This is what my students look like, too. <laughs> of course, I gave them tomorrow off because I'm still here. So. Oh, man. So All right. And last questions? All right. Well, I know some of you will be joining us for dinner, and you can ask more questions uh, at that time. Thank you, Tom. It was fantastic. Sure.